Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 103 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. Hopefully you know that by now. Um, but if not, that's what it is. And for about the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about things that are important to me, I think are worthy of your attention. Um, any comments, questions, reactions, whatever you have to the show should be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And since I know you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be displayed somewhere around here a couple of times during the show. You can get the email address from there. Uh, I do answer my email, sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. Uh, the thing I ask though is that um, when you send me email, please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. All right, with those necessary introductions out of the way, let's get to it. I always like to start when I can with good news. Unfortunately, good news is rather hard to come by this week. But uh, there was one little bit of good news. Uh, Maryland has passed a medical marijuana bill. Governor Martin O'Malley, who supported the measure, is of course then expected to sign it. In this case, the, the medical marijuana, the drug would be administered by medical staff at, um, at centers, academic centers around the state that are also charged with measuring the effects of the program. Uh, the O'Malley administration called this a yellow light approach as opposed to uh, other states where they've allowed private dispensaries to open. Now, because of the time to set the program up, uh, these, uh, there won't be any distribution until about 2016, but it is coming. Uh, Maryland uh, thus joins 18 other states, Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Washington, an interesting combination of, of red and blue states, plus the District of Columbia in allowing for medical marijuana. In addition, several states have decriminalized possession of small amounts of marijuana, uh, usually with no more a penalty than a fine of up to about $100. And three states, Alaska, Colorado, and Washington, have actually um, legalized possession of small amounts for adults. Uh, and the, uh, the Pew Research poll, published April 4th, showed that 52% of Americans now say that they favor the legalization of marijuana, and 72% say the cost of the drug war is not worth it. This is the first time in, poll, uh, in Pew's polling that a majority has said they're in favor of legalization. Back in 1969, it was only 12%. Uh, Ten years ago, it was only a third. Three years ago, it was at 41%, which means support for legalization has gained 11 percentage points in just three years. And, um, well, I think that's good news because the drug war is a big waste. All right, so now from there uh, to our regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. Uh, the question here is, what do, the, what do the following things all have in common? Having gone through a bankruptcy, your political views, favoritism, nepotism, your appearance, your credit history, your weight, being sick, and having been unemployed. What do all those things have in common? The answer is they are all perfectly legal ways of discriminating against you in hiring and employment. I'm going to just very quick go through these very quickly. The bankruptcy code says you cannot be fired or denied promotion because you went through a bankruptcy. However, it doesn't say anything about not hiring you in the first place. The, um, some, states, some states have laws that prohibit discrimination based on your political affiliation. That is what party you belong to or what politics you believe in. Others don't. And even then, in most cases, if you express those views, like you go to a demonstration or maybe even write a letter to the editor, you can be fired for that. Uh, it, it comes as a surprise to most people to know that the only people, the only employees who actually have First Amendment protection are employees of the federal government. Uh, also, favoritism at work, you know, is of course legal. You know, if somebody just wants to favor their, their, uh, their friends, their family, their neighbors, whatever, over you, that's perfectly legal. It's absolutely legal. Um, now, the thing is, if you're a member of a protected group 
and they discriminate against you because you're a member of that group, well, that's illegal. But let's put it this way. If somebody said, I won't hire you because you're black, that's illegal. If they said, oh, it's not because you're black, I just don't like you, that's legal. Related to that, um, in the private sector, not so much in the public sector, but in the private sector, nepotism is also quite legal. Uh, it's entirely legal for employers to, again, value families and friends over others. Appearance discrimination means basically discriminate against you based on how you look. I don't think you're pretty enough. I think you're too ugly. I think you're too pretty. I think you're whatever. I don't like your clothes. I don't like the style of clothes you wear. This is appearance discrimination, and very few places in the United States have any laws against it. If somebody, um, if somebody wants to not hire you because they just don't like you, just don't like your face, hey, that's perfectly fine. Uh, also, in most, in most places, an employer can refuse to hire you if you have a low credit score. Some states have passed now laws against using a credit history as a factor in hiring or promotion. A lot of states haven't. Now, another thing that's mostly legal in most places is weight discrimination, basically refusing to hire you or treating you differently based on your waistline. This also, this again, is completely legal. Again, a very few states and municipalities have restrictions on this, but most don't. So unless your weight is actually related to a serious medical condition or a disability, you can be fired and you have no recourse. Related to that, unless you live in Connecticut or in one of just four cities, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, or Washington, DC, you have no legally guaranteed sick time. Uh, anywhere else, live anywhere else in the country, and unless your illness is related to a narrowly defined set of serious medical conditions or it's related to a disability, you have no protection. Take a day off from work to go to the doctor, you can be fired legally. Uh, actually, the, the, uh, the Philadelphia City Council just recently uh, passed a resolution to make Philadelphia the fifth city with such protection. Unfortunately, the city's mayor, the appropriately named Michael Nutter, uh, vetoed it. Uh, and finally, finally, New Jersey, Oregon, and the District of Columbia have passed laws barring employment discrimination. Everywhere, uh, unemployment, I should say, discrimination, everywhere else in the country, it is legal, in fact, it is common practice to refuse to hire you because you are unemployed. That may sound insane, but it's legal. All right, one of the reasons I wanted to make that our uh, outrage of the week is because I did want to spend some time talking about the economy. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the... Um, one of the big bits of economic news recently, as it generally is every month, was the release of the unemployment figures. According to the Labor Department, the unemployment rate in March was only 7.6%. That's a whole 0.1% less than February. And if you think you detect a little sarcasm there, my only response would be, what do you mean, little? 7.6 unemployment. You know, it's, it's amazing. In fact, it's intolerable to me that this is supposed to be acceptable, that we're supposed to be happy with this. We're supposed to be, oh, isn't this good news? Isn't it just great how well things are going? We're all supposed to play Pollyanna's glad game and just say like, well, we're, we're really glad it's not 10% uh, like it used to be. And, you know, that's true. It's, it's good that unemployment is a couple of percentage points lower than it was before, but that's kind of like being glad that you have skin cancer because at least it's not lung cancer. Or being glad you have six months to live uh, instead of only three months to live. Still, the answer we'll get to that is, well, you know, at least we can be glad the unemployment is creeping down. At least it's not going up. Yeah, except it probably should have. There were a measly 88,000 new jobs created in March. That is much less than half the 190,000 had been predicted and is less than the 150,000 a month that are needed just to absorb new entrants into the workforce. So why didn't the unemployment rate go up? Because nearly half a million people dropped out of the labor force entirely. 
Now, some of those people were retirees. Uh, some of them, a handful of them, may have been people who went back to school. But a lot of them, quite possibly most of them, were people who just gave up looking. They gave up. It had been so long since they'd had work, they gave up even trying to find it. In fact, a lot of them may have been victims of exactly that employment discrimination I just talked about, where you can get the fact that you're unemployed is a reason to not hire you. Well, the thing is, again, it's just, it's just amazing to me that 7.6 unemployment is supposed to be acceptable. It's supposed to be normal. Oh, oh by the way, I forgot, to, I forgot to mention this. The labor participation rate, this is the percentage of working age people who are in the labor force, either working or actively looking for work, is at its lowest level in over 30 years. People are basically just giving up trying to find work. But, you know, we get told, you know, hey, hey, it's all good. It's all good. Move along. Nothing to see here. Uh, even, even the fact that uh, about those dismal job numbers, the 88,000 figure, um, even that doesn't block the happy talkers. I mean, we had, we had such as Rachel Maddow merrily chirping that, oh, don't worry about those numbers. They always get revised, which is true. They do. Sometimes they get revised downward. So 7.6% unemployment. Now, it, yes, it could be worse. It has been worse not that long ago. But that doesn't mean it's good. That doesn't mean things are going well. I mean, it doesn't mean that prosperity's right around the corner, uh, especially when you consider that first-time unemployment claims for the week ending March 30th were up 28,000 over the week before. That is a far bigger increase than had been expected. So, all right, 7.6% unemployment, yes, it's been worse. But the idea that this is some kind of new normal, something we're supposed to be satisfied with, that, that unemployment in the range of 7% is something, well, that's okay now, that idea is obscene. And it's not going to get a whole lot better anytime soon. The Federal Reserve predicts that the unemployment rate is going to remain above 6.5% for at least another two years. They're predicting the unemployment will still be around 7.5% at the end of this year and somewhere between 6.7% and 7% at the end of 2014. The jobs simply aren't there. Corporations simply aren't hiring. Now, I guess they're advertising for people. They're posting jobs. The number of, uh, the number of jobs, the number of job postings, I mean, uh, went up 11% last year to the highest rate in five years. So they're posting the jobs, but they're not filling them. They're simply not hiring people. And it's not that they can't afford it. It's not that they don't have the money. Corporate profits are at an all-time high, and they're going up at a rate of about 20% a year. Those profits, corporate profits, represent the largest portion of the total national income in over 60 years. While the portion going to wages and, and salaries is at its lowest point in nearly 50 years. In fact, wages now, wages now account for the smallest portion of the total gross domestic product since the end of World War II when they started keeping records. That's 70 years ago. And even as corporate profits rise, corporate taxes drop. The corporate tax burden, if you can call it that, now ranks at merely 1.5% of the gross domestic product. To put that in another way, in 1952, corporate taxes provided about a third of all federal expenditures. Now, it's about 9%. The fact is, we are hurting, and we are continuing to hurt. And, and just not the unemployed, of course, it's the employed, too. It's everybody who is not part of the elite is hurting. You know, I'm, I'm trying to give you some ideas about this. Um, we well, often hear about income inequality. In the United States. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, income inequality. But a lot of people don't seem to realize just how dramatic this inequality is. So I want to show you something, OK? Here's a graph. Here's a bar graph, uh, and it shows the results of a study that was done by some folks, Duke University and Harvard Business School, and it asked people what they thought the distribution of wealth in the United States is. Now, that blue bar closest to me represents the poorest 20%, so on and so on and so on, to so the richest 
And this is the results of that survey when they asked people that. And an interesting thing I'll mention very quickly, the, the opinions as to the dis actual distribution of income were pretty consistent across income categories. Pretty much no matter how little or how much money you had, you thought the distribution was about the same. Uh, it shows you know, that the richest 20% got about 55% of the total wealth in the country. All right, well, then they asked those same people, what do you think would be the ideal, the fairest distribution of wealth in the country? This is the result that they got. Notice here that in this one, it is distributed much more fairly. In fact, in this case, the richest 20% get about a third of the national wealth, and the poorest 20% get about 10% of the total national wealth. So what people think it is, what they think it should be. You ready for this? This is what it is. Nearly 85% of the total national wealth is held by the richest 20%. You notice the bottom 40%, the bottom two categories, barely even register on that graph. That is the reality. And the fact is, this has been going on, this is not new, it's been going on for decades. The average American worker, the average American family is worse off than it was in the late 1970s. You're worse off than you were in the late 1970s. The average American family is worse off than it was like 35 years ago. 35 years of work have gotten you literally nowhere. Here's an idea, to give you an idea. Uh, 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 this is not only happening, it's accelerating. Let me give you an idea, okay? During the, uh, the, car, uh, the, 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 the Clinton, rather, the Clinton recovery, Clinton economic recovery, 63%, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 45% of the income gains went to the richest 1%. During the Bush era recovery, 63% of the income gains went to the richest 1%. Are you ready for this? During the um, Obama era recovery, 121% of the income gains went to the richest 1%. Now, how did that happen? This is based on a study by a California, a California, University of California economist, uh, Emmanuel Saz. And he points out that not only did the richest 1% get all of the growth in income, the rest of us lost ground. So we're actually, you know, they got more than 100% of all of the gains. That is the economic reality we're facing. Uh, and, and, what the, and, the, and what the politics, uh, the politicos and the pundits across both parties are proposing to deal with this is exactly the wrong thing to do. And we're going to talk about that next week. Right now, we're taking a break. And we're back. Just very quickly, two things I just wanted to throw in. One, um, Annette Funicello uh, has died of complications stemming from multiple sclerosis. She was 70. I remember her because I was one of those people who had a crush on her watching the, uh, watching the Mickey Mouse Club. The other bit of news related to that, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher has died at 87. I really don't care. All right. Uh, on March 27th, a railroad train carrying uh, Canadian oil derailed near the town of Prairies, uh, Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, which is about 150 miles northwest of Minneapolis. About 15,000 gallons of tar sands were spilled. Now, I've talked about tar sands before. This is the stick tarry sludge that has oil in it um, that the Keystone XL pipeline, if it's built, would carry from Alberta, Canada, down to refineries on the coast of Texas to be refined and exported. It is so thick, so sludgy, that it has to be cut with stuff like benzene to make it thin enough so we can actually get it through a pipeline. Well, now, supporters of the Keystone XL pipeline immediately pointed to this, uh, this accident as proof of the need for the pipeline because pipelines are so much safer than the trains are. Two days later, this happened. Uh... An ExxonMobil pipeline carrying tar sands underneath the town of uh, Mayflower, Arkansas, which is about 20 miles northwest of Little Rock, it burst and it spewed, according to current EPA estimates, nearly 300,000 gallons of this gunk 
uh, into streets and into yards and into houses, many of whose occupants never even knew that there was a pipeline there. ExxonMobil evacuated the neighborhood, quickly instituted what amounted to martial law with either the cooperation or the passive acquiescence of the federal government. The corporation's flunky evicted wildlife rescuers. They threatened reporters with arrest and even won a temporary no-fly area over the town with access to that area controlled by an ExxonMobil representative. Now, the company insists that none of the oil got into nearby Lake Conway, claiming it's placed barriers and 3,600 feet of booms around the lake. Unfortunately, aerial photos say that there is oil in marshes near the lake and there's dead vegetation in the lake. And in fact, the Attorney General of Arkansas, his name is Dustin McDaniel, says there is late, uh, oil in Lake Conway despite the company's uh, um, claims, which is quite possible because remember, tar sands are a sludge. They don't float, they sink. Booms will do you no good. Oh, and here's an interesting sidebar, by the way, to this. A 1980 federal law says that diluted bitumen, which is tar sands, uh, that, that law says that diluted bitumen going through a pipeline is not oil. So companies that are piping, such as ExxonMobil, that are piping this stuff, don't have to pay into the Federal Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund, which is designed to help clean up, pay for the cost of cleanup of of such spills. So, see, so, so, under, so understand this. According to the federal government and the oil industry, oil oil is oil, but tar sands oil is not oil. Okay? So, in other words, this is oil. This is not. This bird is covered with oil. This bird isn't. See how easy that was? Because any pipeline poses risks, all right? Any pipeline poses risk. The thing is, tar sands pipelines create a greater risk. Uh, they are pumped uh, under, under um, greater heat, greater pressure. The material is more corrosive. It corrodes the pipes faster. In fact, um, TransCanada, that's the outfit that owns the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, their first Keystone pipeline leaked 12 times in its first 12 months. And considering that conventional oil was involved in the United States last year in 364 spills, basically one a day, totaling 54,000 gallons of oil, um, frankly, the risk to local environments as well as the risk to global warming is frankly just too high. The XL pipeline should be killed. All right, now for our other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award. Uh, given for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week, the big red nose goes to Texas Republican Representative Louis Gohmert, the man who puts Gomer in Gomert. He was talking about his opposition to gun control last week, and he said, this is a quote. I had this discussion with some wonderful, caring Democrats earlier this week on the issue of, well, they said, surely you could agree to limit the number of rounds in a magazine, couldn't you? How would that be problematic? And I pointed out, well, once you make a 10, then why would you draw the line at 10? What's wrong with 9 or 11? And the problem is, once you draw that limit, it's kind of like marriage. When you say it's not in a man and a woman anymore, then why not have three men and one woman, or four women and one, ma uh, four women and one man, or why not somebody has a love for an animal? There's no clear place to draw the line once you eliminate traditional marriage. And it's the same once you start putting limits on what guns can be used. So in other words, people have to be able to carry loaded assault rifles with 100, gun, with 100 bullet magazines because same-sex marriage leads to bestiality. Clown hardly describes it. But that does bring up the last thing I want to talk about, which is guns. I don't want to talk about guns but I have to talk about guns. Now, I have to admit, there is some good news on this front, a little bit of good news. Robin Kelly, you may remember her, she won the Democratic primary to replace uh, um, Jesse Jackson Jr. Uh, and did so by proudly promoting her F rating from the NRA. Well, in a special election last Tuesday, she won the seat with 72% of the vote. And there is some good news on the state level. In the wake of Newtown, New York has acted. Uh, last month, Colorado was acted. Now, more recently, Connecticut and Maryland have both acted. So there is some good news. But on the federal level, 
The only reaction I can have to what's going on is disgust. Now remember, there were three big pillars to the proposals for federal gun control. Assault weapons ban, a magazine capacity limit, and expand background checks to cover all sales. And there was some other stuff which Charlie got mentioned because it was regarded as a slam dunk. Well, first the assault weapons ban was dumped because Harry Reid, who was against the ban actually, said that the proponents couldn't get the 60 votes needed, so he wasn't even going to try to include it. Uh, so was the, was the right happy? Were the gun nuts happy that that was gone? No, of course not. They turned their fire on the next thing, which was the uh, magazine capacity. That got dumped too. That's not part of the bill. And were they satisfied then? Of course not. Then they went after the background check, the part they'd been regarded as the easy part. They almost, you know, a couple of weeks ago, in 1999, even the NRA supported this. This is supposed to be the easy part, but no, now you drop the first two, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to go after the rest. 90% uh, of Americans support the expanded background checks, uh, even in southern states like Florida, North Carolina, and Virginia. But it didn't matter. It was in trouble, looked like it was going down. In fact, um, the, uh, uh, there was uh, 14 Republican senators who said they were going to filibuster any gun bill which shows you how much backing down achieved for you. Got to the point where Lindsey Graham was smirking, and I'd really like to wipe that smirk off his face to tell you the truth. He was smirking, the legislation was going nowhere. Well, it turns out that that um, uh, threat of a filibuster sort of evaporated because enough Republicans have actually said that was too far. That was going too far for them, filibustering background checks. So actually, it looks as though we might actually get some form of background check uh, because two senators, a Democrat and a Republican, have announced a bipartisan proposal uh, for background checks, which has loopholes, but at least it's tighter than the one we've got. But the thing is, think how far we've fallen from an assault weapons ban and magazine limits to at most we're going to get a weakened version of a background check that was previously thought a slam dunk. And why? Why? Why is this happening? I mean, we don't even get told that it's out, of, uh, it's out of genuine conviction. Here's a quote for you. Here's a quote. 21 Democratic seats are being contested in the 2014 elections, many of them in red states where the NRA, which opposes background checks, is a force to be reckoned with. Among them are Kay Hagan, Mark Pryor, Mary Landrieu, and Max Baucus. So this is what we are supposed to live with. This is what we're supposed to happen. Let there be more massacres, more Newtowns, more Columbines, more Gappy Giffords, uh, because these people, because these people are such intellectual cowards and moral degenerates that they would rather let the carnage continue, let the blood run in the streets, let our towns and communities be filled with grieving parents, orphan children, and devastated communities, rather than that they might risk their job. You people have blood on your hands, and I will not let you forget it. We'll see you next week.